Hurricane Caroline. Another name mantle. Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask, we ask, we pray for Mike, we pray for Tom, we pray for Diana. Lord Jesus, and for all of the laborers that you have sent to establish this church. Lord, it is a great honor to be called to establish the church. It is a great honor to be called to start a church. And Lord, we're not looking for honor down here. We're looking for when we get to heaven, what does heaven have to say? We want to get it right in heaven. Oh, Lord, Jesus, help us get it right in heaven. So, Lord, we welcome you in here today. I ask you to take this word, God. Do with it as you please, because it's your word. And, Lord, we, but we pray just to come into your presence, just to gather unto you your sweet anointing, Lord, just to be in your holy presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And, Lord, we bless this baby Caroline. <laughs> and we bless the mother to be healed. We bless Sonia for taking care of her daughter and Colt and Kate. And Lord, we thank you that Kimberly is okay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.
sperato e allora da tu a c'ha una via di lì e c'è e che non so se c'è io c'ha io di io di io ma a io di non è solo la la io di io di io oggi è mi che non metti la a sono io se la che non mi dice e bene la a va sono io c'ho la io is chaotic. Seal off your ears from the chaos of vain speaking. Because God does not listen to vain words. Seal off your ears. Circumcise your ears. Circumcise your ears from the vain speaking of the world. Amen. Oh, okay. This morning I um, just got a whole lot of telephone calls. people were quit making it bigger than what it was. And then when the Lord was dealing me with their circumcise your ears, don't listen. God doesn't listen to it. It says that joke. I read it yesterday. Okay. Hallelujah. Hold me. Maybe I should tell you this. I don't know. I will tell you. Has nothing to do with my message, but there's some reason. I told Sandra on the way here. Okay, my friend Sue Avery, you know what a prophetic intercessor she is and how she's prayed for this church for years, and she's been through some really hard times the last few years, especially with her granddaughter and her own health. And she had a stroke in December and almost died. Okay, so she called me this morning, and she says, I have a dream that I need you to to tell you about and see what you've got to say about it. Now, just yesterday, I had um, read in Job, I don't know, I think it's 38 or something, toward the last chapters there, because I finished Job yesterday, uh, about the gates of death. And I looked at that and I thought, Lord, I've never thought about these gates of death and then the gates of hell, but I realized this was a different place. These gates of death are a different place. And um, so I pondered it for a while and looked at it, read it two or three times, but went on and forgot about it. And when I say I forgot about it, I forgot about it. Well, Sue calls me this morning and she tells me that since she had the stroke, she's been having dreams of dead people that she knew when she was growing up and through the years, just dead people who've been long ago dead for the past dead. Didn't even hit my brain till it came out of my mouth. When you had that stroke, you went to the gates of death. And I said, these are familiar spirits that have come out of that gate. And of course, she knows she knows they're familiar spirits and she knows uh, how to break it off. And But see, it, I just, Lord just had me read that yesterday. And that these familiar spirits come from the gates of death. So I was sitting at my computer when I was talking, telling her this. And I thought, well, I'm going to look up gates of death and see how many times it's in the Bible. It's in there three times. It's in Job and twice in the Psalms. Lucy's looking it up right now. I think it's Job 38, for sure. 
And um, so as we were talking, and of course, she was sick, but we were both sick at the same time, and yeah, that yeah. COVID That's right. brings with it an agreement with death. Because it is, it's just like, you know, God, it's my time to go. Well, let's just go. And this is thing is wearing me down and blah, 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 you know. Okay, but the, what the Lord showed me, that COVID brings in the spirit of death. Where you come into agreement with it. Oh, my gracious. But we know better. We know we're going to fight it because it's not our time to go. Yeah. Okay, so this came in. COVID has gone to the gates of death and brought death with it yeah. as a familiar spirit. And the Lord just showed me this morning about these gates. I never separated them from hell before. Yeah. Yeah. As you drew me down on my table talk this morning, the Lord was giving me three minutes ago. He's written a book. The Will I Have Found You. I would encourage everyone, it'll be on again tonight at 7.30. Um, this business of these um, vile weapons goes mm -hmm. way, way back, and Fauci has been there. This went all the way back to Richard Nixon. And he's been in that office forever. And he's been there forever. Yes, and he's so revealing. I mean, I was praying for him because, I mean, I guess he's protected because his name's Kennedy and he's so high profile. But it is absolutely unbelievable what this government has done. And this was totally intentional. They've been creating these weapons. Richard Nixon told the CIA to stop it. Oh. But they didn't. They just went into it. And Which is why it. they had to get rid of him. Bye, bye, bye. There you go. Whoa! Oh. I would miss on that. Whoa! Whoa! They had, they had you set this up to get rid of him. Oh my goodness! And the CIA and all that's been in conjunction with the CDC, the NIH, whatever. And Fauci has been right in the middle of it. The whole that man is evil beyond description. But anyway, if you if you really want to, it's, it's interesting and very enlightening. And I applaud Joni. She mm -hmm. and, and, and Robert Kennedy said he can't take us anywhere except. Joni and Daystar is the only platform wow. that he's been given to allow him to speak. It is unbelievable. That is so bad. Well, um, I saw, and I'm, I get so much going through my head, but I saw where someone else who's been involved in exposing some of this Ukraine stuff died. Some kind of low level politician. It was. Just had a heart attack. He was in his 40s and 50s and just had a heart attack. But he, he, was, he was a low level, but evidently he knew a lot. Yeah. Did you watch this scripture? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe this stuff is, it, it's like the devil's been trying to, with Fauci and all this other, have been trying to take our whole nation, not just to the gates of death, but through it. Right. This has all been intentional. None of this right. has been accidental. Mm -hmm. Right. And but for the church and the grace of God, we're still here. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 7, Traditions Broken. <laughs> I think we've broken everything out here. <laughs> I hope uh, we don't have our own traditions. So, this chapter is the beginning of the separation between the ceremonial law and the traditions of the Old Testament and the new covenant of Christ's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Right here in this chapter is where Jesus starts to break it off. With confrontation. <laughs> and from here on, there will be confrontation. From here on, he keeps on, he keeps on with breaking this break. Within three and a half years of Jesus' death, the temple in New Jerusalem will cease to be the vehicle of God's redemptive work on earth. 
and then so you said Jesus is beginning the process right here. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 32. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And according to the covenant that I made with their for not according, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. New covenant, not the old covenant. So the chapter begins with Pharisees and scribes traveling 100 miles from Jerusalem to Galilee to pick a quarrel with Jesus. Well, do we uh, have, we might as well put our map up, I guess. Um, he's not so much on the Sea of Galilee right now, but he's working around it. Um, Mark 7, 1 through 5. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. When they saw some of his disciples eat bread with, de with defile, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Not Moses' law. Tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. So the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? but eat bread with unwashed hands. It's certainly good hygiene to wash before eating, and no harm to it, but they place religion in it. They made it a religion. They interposed their authority and commanded all to do it or else be excommunicated uh, from the Jewish religion. It, you could be excommunicated. Or not washing your hands. This they kept up as tradition of the elders and a rule of the rabbis. Y'all, let's don't ever get into this kind of foolishness. In Jewish demonology, the pledging of the hands in water got rid of a spirit called Shabita. S-H-I-B-B-E-T-A. Shabita. An evil spirit which sat upon the hands at night. It was considered to be a female spirit which brings hurt to people, particularly children, who do not wash their hands in the morning. So we got superstition here. Got to be very careful with superstition. If you are superstitious about anything, you allow a demon in. You give demon. Okay, superstition gives demons power. Once you are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm in his righteousness. I'm covered with his righteousness. I've been redeemed. I do not fear demons. Amen. And once you get to the place where you do not fear demons, they're going to fear you. There is so much superstition. I deal with it all the time with people. They give the demons power by being superstitious. And there's a lot of it in churches. Okay. Do Mark have an example of superstition you see nowadays? I mean, walking under ladders, black hat, that kind of stuff. Oh, no. Okay. Let's say if trouble came to your house. And immediately, uh, in that trouble, you allowed it to be that you were under some sort of demonic attack that was causing that trouble and you were giving that power to the demon. And you were aligning it up with, okay, well this happened and this happened, that means that some demon has control in my house. No. Actually, 
Christians stating that a demon has control, that this is the child of God in this next session? Give me a pound. I got it. Yeah. Oh, we got it. When that thistle and harvest comes in, we're going to. What a cleanup, y'all. We got, yes, what a cleanup. Amen. Are that if you do this, then this is going to happen uh, because of what you did. I'm, I'm talking about. Oh, well, let's talk about a ball game. That if you do exactly the same thing that you did when you won the last ball game, right. then you're under a blessing. But if you switch something up, then you lost the blessing. Yeah. That's superstition. Yeah. yeah. Wear the same clothes. Wear the same clothes to the ball game. Your lucky hat. Your lucky hat. Right, your lucky hat. Yeah. Sure. Luck is superstition. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's giving the devil too much credit. Now, not to say he's not out there like a roaring lion seeking who he might devour. Of course he is. But you don't give him power. I'm blood bought, redeemed child of God. Okay, but and y'all heard me preach this, so I'm preaching to the choir. Whatever Satan has in you. He has power over you. He has power over you in that area. Whatever he has in us, Satan has us. And so it, Jesus never gave place to Satan. Jesus said, Satan has nothing in me. Satan has nothing in me. So whatever Satan has in you, he has power over you. Well, okay, moving right along here. Where did I get out? I got demonology, huh? Should be that. <laughs> Six through nine. Jesus answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We got a lot of that going on now. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Yes. We got a lot of that going on. Yes. Programs, agendas, denominations setting up their own rules. Are laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. We have many, many magnificent churches that are generation after generation after generation, they're holding on to the tradition of their fathers. The washing of the pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. All too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. The Christian church is not made up of the Jewish traditions. Now, they're trying to bring them in. There, there are congregations who are trying to bring the Jewish traditions into the church. <laughs> but many substitutes and not essential traditions make some Christian groups as ridiculous as the Pharisees. Strong word. If anything is condemned by some specific law in scripture, we should leave it alone. But if it is something not definitely condemned 
Let each person answer to God and his conscience as to what he allows. And as far as I'm concerned, you're on your own. I am not going to police you with the word of God. All I do is preach it. You just, between you and God, what God allows you to do. <laughs> Christ argues with the Pharisees concerning the authority by which this ceremony was imposed. It appears he's only speaking to the Pharisees because in verse 14 he calls the multitude forward to himself uh, lest they should hear the Pharisees' offense and bring confusion, I guess. So it sounds like he's just, just speaking to the Pharisees, so now he calls them forward. It, they, this he's just speaking, to, he says, uh, 10 through 13. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father or more, mother, let him be put to death. But you said, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift to God that you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother. Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such thing you did. In other words, I'm just using this one thing as an example, Jesus is saying. Note that Jesus calls the writings of Moses the word of God. Jesus calls the writing of Moses the word of God. That's the reason why some, there is a, one denomination that why just totally doesn't teach the Old Testament because it's it's not that they don't believe it carries over into the New Covenant. Yes, Jesus fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. He became it. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Romans 9, 31 through 32. Joanne, I thought of you last night when you asked me to do Romans. I said, Lord, as soon as we finish Mark, we're going to do Romans. I love Romans. It, Romans delivered me and healed me when I was teaching it one time. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Okay? They, they never got there. All their rules and all their regulations and all their sacrifices and all their priests and the temple, they never, they never attained it. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. 10 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Christ is the end of the law. Why is he the end of the law? Because he fulfilled it. He fulfilled every sacrifice. He fulfilled every uh, feast day. He fulfilled the temple. He became the temple walking on the earth. The temple was walking around, on, I say walking around in overalls on earth as a carpenter's son. And that, that was where the temple was. It was in Jesus. He fulfilled the whole temple. He fulfilled the priesthood. He fulfilled the kingly anointing. They even crowned him with a crown of thorns and put a royal robe upon him. Okay, moving along here. Where did I get to? God commands children to honor their parents, not only by the law of Moses, but by the law of nature. It is the duty of the children, if their poor, poor parents are poor, to support them according to their ability. This is just what Jesus just said. Mm -hmm. According to the law of Moses, children are worthy to die that curse their parents. How much more so if they starve them? 
according to the tradition of the elders, if they swear by the Corban, that is the gold of the temple, and their gift upon the altar, then they are not obligated to care for the parents. And by this wicked vow, the tradition of the elders discharges them from the obligation. Matthew 7, 14 through 17. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. Now that is the words of Jesus. We got a lot of that defiling going on now. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. Cam, are you cold? Go. Okay. Those are the things that defile a man. Um, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. <clears throat> Jesus rebukes the disciples again. We get in chapter 8, then we'll get another rebuke. Because <laughs> they don't understand. In chapter 6, Christ sent them forth two by two with authority to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out clean, unclean spirits. And they came back, and they were boasting about doing all this and how wonderful it all was and how much authority and power they had over unclean spirits. They have seen him perform miracle after miracle, but their minds do not yet comprehend the new covenant of Christ's kingdom compared to the law of Moses, of which they have been born into and lived their whole life in. They've got you to, to come into God's kingdom. Even if you are born today, you have to receive a new mindset. You cannot take the old mindset into the kingdom of God. It doesn't fit. The old mindset is the mindset of the world system. But the mindset of the kingdom of God is a totally different mindset. And this is the battle that is going on in the world today. These people who do not know Christ's mind and his mindset are following after the spirit of Antichrist. And there is a remnant church on the earth who is moving in the mind of Christ. And this is the division that is upon our earth. I think I'm safe to clarify here that Jesus is speaking of food and drink that is not poisonous or toxic or would cause harm to the body. Very clear statement, though, he says. It's not what goes into it, a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of it. Then, okay, wait a minute, I'm ahead of myself. Um, 18 through 23. Jesus said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? He's getting out of bed even with them. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? Now that's an incredible statement. Just written, I'm just told, it's written. It is what comes out of a man that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Then it's J. Day calls these 13 sins that damn the soul. And under the sin of evil thoughts, he lists 24 examples of evil thought sins, and I didn't list them but uh, because, because I was going on in a different direction. 
and under evil eye he lit seven sins. Jesus reproves them for their hypocrisy in pretending to honor God when really they had no such design in their religious observances. A lot of our religious services now are set up to honor people, not God. Platforms to bring honor to ministers, not to God. Our ministry, do not seek honor. Give honor to whom honor is due. But don't. Seek God, and then the honor will come from God. But there's so much of that out there, vainglory, vanity of religion, and people want to be seen and heard. And Lord Jesus, to deliver us all. Jesus reproves them for placing religion in the inventions and injunctions of their elders and rulers. They taught for doctrines, the traditions of men. We still got that going on. A man will get a revelation and build a church around it. You see, they have it. Uh, look at the Mormon church. I don't know. I didn't have no problem that this man saw an angel. Maybe, you know, maybe he did. But it's not an extension of the Bible. You don't build a church around that visitation with that angel. You don't build a whole denomination. You don't add to the word of God another book. That's the doctrines of men. Okay, moving right along here. Jesus reproves them for laying aside the commandments of God. They were entrusted to expound the law and to enforce it. Under pretense of using that power, they violated the law and dissolved the bonds of it. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Chapter 3, 10 through 12. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written. You put yourself back under that law. And you're putting yourself back under the curse. Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. We put ourselves back under the law. We're coming back under the curse. I got the anointing on that. That landed. <laughs> no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The law is not a faith. Now, in the heroes of faith, then. In uh, Hebrews 12, 11 and 12, Moses, by faith, I think it's about five times in there, Moses, by faith, did this. Moses, by faith, did this. So Moses was able to bring the law and to do what God called him to do, not because of the law, but because of his faith. And that is what he's commended for, is his faith. Huh? Yes. Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Every curse was broken at the cross. Every single curse of the Old Testament was broken at the cross. I'm not under the curse. I'm not under the Old Testament curse. I'm not under the curse of the law. I'm not under the curse of the time. I'm not under the curse of Eve. I'm not under the curse of the ground. 
men are not under the curse of Adam. I'm not under the law. And I'm not going back under it. And I'm not, as long as I'm the preacher in this church, they're not going to bring it in here. And call it uh, a better religion. A more pure religion. Okay. Moving right along. That somebody, somebody out there on the internet, you need to hear that. You know, we're about to go back under the law of the Old Testament because you thought it would be more pure than the grace of Jesus' is new covenant. Or maybe somebody will hear this down the road somewhere. But you were about to go put yourself back under that law. Huh? Don't do it. Hallelujah. Jesus' ministry in Galilee is now concluded. He has made a clear declaration of his freedom from many of the regulations of Judaism. Using two examples. This termination with the traditions of Judaism is the prelude to his second journey into Gentile territory. This time he proceeds not eastward, but northward to the vicinity of Tyre. I don't think we got Tyre on there. No. Okay. Uh, these next verses opens up the power of the gospel to the Gentiles. So when I'm putting this together, I'm into it. Yeah, y'all know, I'm there. I'm into it. I said, oh, Lord, we get to be there when you open it up to the Gentiles. That'd be us. Huh? That'd be us. That'd be us. Mark 7, 24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. God has kept us hidden. We're even hidden now. We're even in hidden lights. Because God has kept us hidden, even at Little White Church we were hidden, Country Club we were hidden, you know, these are places that you don't go unless you, you know, you just can't just walk. Anybody can't just go to the country club. <laughs> God has kept us hidden all these years. This hiddenness has been a protection for us. I could not preach what I preach without having to deal <sighs> with a whole flood of stuff coming at me, which I would ignore. I do. I ignore it. Uh, but it would it would be a it would be something I would have to be dealing with, or maybe try you know it would be trying to deal with. Uh, but and the time is coming, which all the prophets say it when they come in here, that we're not going to be hidden any longer. But y'all are ready. Y'all are ready to deal with whatever comes through that door. Um, I shared it Sunday morning because it was about uh, the mantles. It wasn't about the mantles. He brought it up with the 12 12. He was trying to figure it out, and I got confirmation. Wednesday, when, I closed, when we closed up, I made a statement. I said, Y'all have got the authority over this, y'all don't need me anymore. Now, I didn't mean I was going anywhere. I just meant, y'all got this. Okay, but it just came out of my mouth, okay? And y'all been doing it without me when I travel or go some places for years. But it just rolled out of my mouth that uh, it, it had been, the mantle had been extended. Uh, you, you haven't got a junior mantle, you got the 
full mantle. The full government mantle of authority. After 19 years of faithfulness, that guy didn't tell me it was because of faithfulness. He just said, y'all got it. Okay, so Sunday morning, when he brought up about the 12-12, I told y'all that God told me that the governmental a mantle had fallen on the Tuesday, on the Wednesday prayer group. The whole group. Now that's not a junior mantle. That means you, with boldness, you take the full authority of the word of the governmental or mantle of Jesus Christ and you decree it and you declare it to the world about you. This is 
a trying of the Gentile faith to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ right here. Right here. Thank God for this woman. He's testing her to see if she is going to have the faith to press in and to lay hold of him. He is also making it clear to his disciples that the gospel of his kingdom is for the Gentiles and he is releasing it to them. Now they still don't have a clue. Let the children first be filled. For the Jews have all the miracles given to them and let not that which was intended for them be thrown to those who are not of God's family and who are as dogs in comparison to them. And, you know, that with Ishtar and Baal and Molech controlling the Gentile community, that's pretty much what they were filled up with. <clears throat> but there was a but. Let the children first be filled. There is mercy and reserve for the Gentiles. The Jews had already begun to be surfeited with the gospel of Christ. Some of them had desired him to depart out of their coasts. Remember? Yes, Lord, she says. I'm paraphrasing. I know it's the children's bread, but the dogs were never denied the crumbs, and they are allowed a peace place under the table. I ask not for a loaf. No, nor for a mor morsel, only for a crumb. He gave it to her. She got the whole loaf. But she also got the whole loaf for the Gentile nation. Not only to her, but the entire Gentile race who will receive him as Savior. Her faith and humility pleaded not only for her daughter, but for us as well. The unclean spirit that is in the church that is over the Gentile nation of the United States of America of Ishtar homosexuality uh, Baal worship and Molech the children of baby um, this woman stood before Jesus and she asked for the crumb And Lord, you gave it to me. Now I claim it. I claim it. I claim the whole loaf, just like you gave that woman. I claim it. And I claim it to give us authority over this unclean spirit that rules over the United States of America. Lord, we take the whole loaf and we command Baal and Ishtar and Moloch out of this Gentile nation and we claim it by this woman's faith for Jesus Christ. This is a good preaching, Jesus. Bring shame on the arrogance and hypocrisy of some in the Gentile church of the 21st century. It judges us. Yes. 31 through 35. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. They brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. 
And they begged him to put his hand on him. He took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. And he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephphatha, Ephphatha, I had that looked up, Ephphatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened and the impediment string of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. This healing is not recorded in any of the other three Gospels. Notice those attending him did not ask Jesus to heal him, only to put his hand on him. Thus honoring Jesus to do it as he was pleased to bring glory to God. Jesus took him aside from the multitude. He used acts with action to do this cure. Now this morning during, during worship, it came to me to circumcise our ears, to put our fingers in our ears. I didn't, I'm just now connecting the two. So we were doing a prophetic action to open up the deafness of our ears that we may, be, we may hear better. We all need to hear better. And he used his saliva to touch his tongue. Jesus looked to heaven, but he also directed his patient, who could see, to look to heaven. He could see, just couldn't hear. Jesus was conveying to him his healing was through divine power. It's important to note that King James reads, string of his tongue was loosed. Death's most, a man chain or shackle of a prisoner or impediment or disability, Band, bond, strength. Also used as a binding by a satanic power in Luke 13, 16, the string of the tongue was supernaturally cut and also the demon that bound the tongue was cast out. Okay? And it has a name. Desmos. D-E-S-M-O-S. So if we're dealing with a tongue that is bound, we need to cast out that spirit, despos, D-E-S-M-O-S. Jesus sighed. This Jesus sighed. <laughs> Did his sigh express sadness, relief, or tiredness? I choose relief since I'm teaching. <laughs> Teacher's choice. Teacher's choice. <laughs> Perhaps sadness at the demon that had caused this hardship and our lack of ability to be able to deal with it. This is another proof of Christ being the Messiah. It was foretold that by his power, the ears of the deaf should be unstopped and the tongue of the dumb should be made to sing. Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. There are various means of administrating, administering divine healing. The first I want to point out, see, Jesus is confirming in every one of his actions that he's the Messiah. And when we get to chapter 8, the disciples are still just Okay, but he is confirming, like when he walked on water, it says in, the, in Psalms that he'll walk on water. So all of his actions are confirming that he's the Messiah. Okay, so the different, there are different ways of ministering divine healing, and I think I got 10 here, but don't, don't hold me to it. There's whatever, whatever he says. Laying on of hands, the spoken word, the elders anoint with oil and pray, the prayer of faith, the Lord's Supper, point of contact, handkerchiefs and aprons, casting out devils, gifts of healings, and word of knowledge. I'm sure that's not all. Here Jesus used, um, well, he cast out a demon, that's what he did. 
I would hope we would not limit the Holy Spirit in healing miracles, nor give the glory to Satan. Satan does not heal. He brings sickness and death. Healing can be instantaneous, gradual, or progressive, conditional, and unconditional. Naaman's was conditional. Unconditional, Jesus just did it. Mark 7, 36 through 37. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. They were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. Well, He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Some say it was Christ's humility that He desired for the people to go and tell no man. Yes, He was humble, but I'm inclined to believe He was able to accomplish more in the short period of time He was allotted for His ministry away from the crowds because the crowds are fickle. The crowds are still fickle. There's not a fickle saint in this church. God has proven you. Not a single one of you are fickle. And then there's a time for solitude and then there's a time to go out We've been greatly blessed and protected at East Coast Church. But if we are to fulfill our call to the harvest, we too will seek our times of solitude. And then we will obey and go out. The prophets continue to decree that our congregation will be part of the harvest. He made it very clear on Sunday morning. I think he said it two or three times. You are going to be part of it. You're going to be in it. And with the strength that we have and with the, the numbers that we have, we think, Lord, how can that be? Well, I can tell you that my whole life couldn't be unless God did it. And when he told me, I became a different person. And it became, I just walked into God. That's all I know. One day I just walked into God and I haven't ever left it. Next week we'll study the feeding of the 4,000 Gentiles. Say Gentiles. Gentiles. This again is a prophetic, prophetic sign of the full power of the gospel being given to the Gentile nation. The 5,000 were Jews. They were fed with five loaves and two fish. With 12 baskets full left over. With the 4,000, there were seven loaves and a few small fish. There were seven baskets left over. These are prophetic numbers. 12 is the number of government, and seven is the number of full perfection. Now, see. I've opened this, I, Lord, I haven't done anything, okay? But the way I've approached this, I'll put it that way, was to open it up prophetically for what it is revealing to us through prophecy of chapter 7. Okay? I'm not just telling you what happened or what Jesus did. I'm, the Lord is allowing me to open it up and it's prophetic of what's going on and what his plans are for the church and for the latter days. And when we get into chapter 8, feeding the 4,000 Gentiles is another prophetic action of what he's doing in the Gentile nation.
Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.